You're listening to Sprout Money's Monthly Wrap-Up with Craig Hemke. Welcome back to the Sprout Money News and SproutMoney.com Monthly Wrap-Up for the month of June 2022. As usual, I'm your host, Craig Hemke. Joining us this month is an old friend, Grant Williams. Grant is co-founder of Real Vision. He writes a fantastic newsletter called Things That Make You Go Hmm. He's also the uh, speaker, I guess, if you will, at the Grant Williams podcast. Of course, all of this can be found at grant-williams.com. You can also follow him on Twitter. He's a great analyst and a financial commentator, and it's great to have him join us. Grant, thank you so much for your time. Hey, mate. It's great to see you. It's been a long, long time since we've chatted. Not crazy. I don't know. I don't even know where the time goes. Um, but yeah, right. geez, it's crazy. And, and things are certainly seeming to speed up. Um, before we get into the questions and the discussion about the, the month that uh, is just about to conclude, I want to jump forward uh, just a few days and wish all of our Canadian listeners a happy Canada Day on July the 1st, but also Independence Day is coming for the U.S. You get a three-day market holiday weekend coming up next week. Sprout Money is celebrating both holidays with some special prices on our best-selling Canadian and American bullion products. So, of course, visit SproutMoney.com to take advantage of the discounts. You can also call them at 888-861-0775. Grant, let's... um, Let's dive in. I think you're the perfect guest for this month because the precious metals are just flipping and flopping and going sideways and grinding lower. And they seem like they will continue to do so until the Fed uh, finally pivots away from this uh, quantitative tightening uh, charade that they uh, continue to play. Uh, so let's start there. Um, they're, they're trying to tell us all that they're, that they're going to drive rates up until they get them above uh, to get the Fed funds rate above the uh, rate of inflation. Do you think they'll get there? Is that uh, something that might actually happen? No, no, I don't think they will. I think they are going to try and get rates up as high as they can in the shortest amount of time possible um, to give themselves room to cut again when the next crisis comes. Um, so I, I don't think they'll get there at all. I think they're, I think they're serious about people thinking they're serious at the moment. And, mm. and I think they probably will hike further than people expect. Uh, I think they will hike into a recession. And you know, the one thing that they've managed to do by, by having these large increases, you know, 75 basis points, rumors of another 75, people talk possibly 100, is at least they can, they can give themselves some clear air quickly. You know, if they, if they, let's say they go 100 next time and, and talk yeah. about maybe 50 the next time after that, look, they're, they're being hawkish. They're managing expectations. Hopefully, it will help them dampen um, inflation expectations, which is the key thing they need to address. But whether inflation comes down or not remains to be seen. I suspect we're we're due for a little cooling off period in the in the headline CPI numbers. Um, and you know, of course, if 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 inflation moderates to say five percent down from eight. It, it gives them enough cover to say, well, we're going we're gonna to pause and, and be data dependent again. And then they've, you know, they've got a couple of percent in the bag. So right now, it's all a game of optics. Um, we all know that inflation is a problem. We all know that it's largely supply side driven. But the, the, the kind of X factor is the expectations, which are, which are high and growing. And if you can't dampen those expectations, then then they do have a problem on their hands. So, you know, it remains to be seen. I think they will keep hiking. I think they're, they're serious about being taken seriously. The question is, how far do they have to go before people are convinced enough that they're serious to, to kind of exhale a little bit? And, and that remains to be seen. What do you think, Grant, about what we're seeing around the world? I mean, this is putting great pressure on the Bank of Japan to keep their yield curve control uh, plans in place. Uh, great pressure, it seems, on the EU, who is, I mean, without EU or ECB, I'm saying, uh, without ECB bond buying, it seems that um, we'd have another sovereign debt crisis and what everybody used to call the pigs. Uh, the stock market's down 20%. What, uh, what, what might be the biggest driver of forcing them to pivot? Well, if you look around, really, the, the, everything you just talked about has been a problem. For a decade, the only new problem we have is inflation, right? And that's so that's that's the that's the 
wrinkle to all this that these guys haven't had to to face before. We've we've had pigs debt crises. They've managed to fend off through lowering rates and buying bonds. We've we've they've managed to use those two tools of of asset purchases and and lowering interest rates to fight off every crisis that they've had for over a decade now, pushing on 20 years. But the only reason they've been able to do that is because they haven't had inflation on the other side of the equation. So they, they could lower rates without fearing inflation. They could buy assets without fearing inflation. Now they're kind of hemmed in by the, re- the reappearance of inflation because every time they do something now, they run the risk that it has a negative impact on those inflation numbers. So the problem's the same, the solutions are likely going to be the same. It's the outcome that's in question. And there is a very strong possibility that the outcome this time won't be the same as the outcomes they've had previously. Okay. So that leads me directly to the question. Thank you. That I most wanted to ask you because it seems as if the fed is just simply playing the same old game. You know, they think they can uh, uh, through their, monetary policy drive up rates and then get an economic slowdown and then they think the floodgates will open and here will come the bid for treasuries again driving rates back down what if that doesn't happen this time grant i mean already the japanese have been net sellers defending yield curve control we got the russians and the chinese walking away uh because of what happened back in march in the ukraine situation uh, do you think that's a risk that maybe next they'll be surprised and next time uh, they're really going to have to ramp up qe just to try to get rates back down yeah, no, absolutely, I do. I, I think there's a big surprise for them coming. Um, you know, is it a surprise? We're sitting here mm. talking about these. There's all kinds of commentators talking about this stuff. This is not Newton. They understand that this is a potential outcome. Um, they're rooted in models and academics rather than mm. the real world. So I think that puts them at a disadvantage at, at times like this. But look, you, you mentioned Japan, and Japan's a, a, a very important case here because they have had – no problems with this stuff for years. And everyone's been scratching their head saying, you know, how is it possible that Japanese can have their cake and eat it? They can continue to print money. They can continue to buy up the entire JGB market, buy ETFs, buy everything they want. It's not reflected in the currency. It's not reflected anywhere. And of course, now their their inflation target is 2%, which was a world away from the deflation they've, they've struggled through. And inflation, CPI inflation in Japan is above that. It's at 2.5% now. And very quickly, there was um, the, the central bank governor, Kuroda san talked in a press conference a couple of weeks ago how the Japanese were um, quite willing to accept higher prices. And there was a massive backlash against that. And he was forced to apologize about it and say that, you know, he could have chosen his words more carefully. So that shows you where the Japanese mindset is. Again, the, the, the public there are already worried at, at 2.5% inflation. They've got no whiff of the 8% inflation they're seeing in the United States. So, you know, again, this, the return of inflation, whether you believe it's a long-term problem, a structural problem, or just temporary, it ties one hand behind their backs. Because if you do have inflation and people are worried about it and you start cutting rates, it's going to be reflected in that number. So they really are in the corner that we've all kind of been aware they were painting themselves into for multiple years now. And it remains to be seen how it plays out. You know, we don't know. Um, but I suspect they're not going to get things the way they the way they want them. And, and you can see that in Japan. Look at what's happening to the yen. The yen's incredibly weak. Mm-hmm. The market is finally starting to test this 25 basis point cap on the 10-year JGB, having just kind of left it alone to the extent where there have been days when the Japanese 10-year doesn't trade, which is unbelievable. You know, zero trades go through in in the kind of pivot point of a, a sovereign yield curve. It's just unthinkable. But now the market is starting to say, all right, well, we can see the corner. We can see they're, they're weak. Let's start pushing it. So the yen's you know, gone through 135. The JGB futures have spiked significantly. And the Bank of Japan is under threat now. So we'll, you know, it remains to be seen what they do. But you know, go back to 92 and Soros taking on the Bank of England, England um, when, they, when he forced them out of the exchange rate mechanism. It's not unthinkable or unheard of that central banks get punched in the nose by markets. We just haven't seen that happen for almost 30 years. So people have forgotten that it happens, but mm-hmm. it does. And I suspect there are going to be people throwing a few punches at these guys for the first time in some time. And with that, let's just go back to where we started. If the pre- if it seems as if the precious metals are kind of stuck here, they may begin to anticipate all of this uh, before we know. 
but it seems as if prices are stuck until uh, these policies reverse. So if you had to guess, what would be that ultimate driver of that reversal? I mean, is it uh, the stock market falling another 20%? I mean, is there one thing that you think when that happens, okay, this is, this is why the Fed won't get rates above inflation, and that's why they're going to have to come back with the QE? Well, it's, it's usually a crisis that will make them pivot. Um, and the stock market, it was really interesting. This is, this is kind of the least panicked stock market meltdown we've had yeah. in quite some time. Um, the markets are down a lot further than people feel like they're down. And that's, that's incredibly fortunate for the Fed because they haven't had to come in and stabilize panicked markets. There's a lot of stress in the credit markets. That's, that's where the most likely problems are going to be. Um, but they haven't kind of manifested themselves yet. We haven't seen, you know, headlines about stock market crashes. We've just seen stocks are down. You know, it's tech stocks are down, and high price stocks are down, overvalued stocks are down. But we haven't seen any panic yet. But it's it's that panic that will force them to do something. It's crisis that always forces them to do something. Now, what what happens when there is a crisis is anybody's guess because. As we've as we've already said, they will use the same tools, but the outcome may be different. They may cut rates and find that it doesn't work. You know, they may start buying asset prices, and it, uh, assets, and it doesn't work. We don't, we just don't know yet. But for for precious metals, you know, crisis is always a good time to own them. And again, I, I hammer on this a lot, talking about the price of gold and the price of silver. I just don't focus on those. You know, I want to I want to be in possession of them when the crises hit. Um, and I want to have them for periods of inflation. Uh, and I'm not so much bothered about the price. I'm, I'm, I'm worried more about my purchasing power, frankly. And, and they've got a very good track record of protecting that over the longer term. So um, there will be another crisis, even though Janet Yellen promised us we wouldn't see one in her lifetime. <laughs> uh, they will throw the same old tools at the crisis, but I think the outcome will be different. And when that outcome is different and we don't get what they expect, then they're going to be forced into things like buying stocks, for example, which they shouldn't be able to do, but they will find a way when, when they need to. And at that point, it'd be evident that it's a real crisis. And at that point, I suspect pressures will react as something that you need to own in a crisis. Yeah. That, I, yeah. I think we all, we all see that coming as well. Do you think, Grant, there will be a time... Uh, where the mining shares will go. You know, I, I remember that great presentation you gave. I mean, heck, four or five years ago. Remember you called it Nobody Cares? Uh, geez, yeah. five years on and still, I mean, people, nobody cares even less, right? Um, what do you Well, no, you're right. Sector? I mean, look, they have cared. They have cared in the interim at various points, but as a speculation, you know, I mean, people, my, mining shares are great speculations and people love to to gamble on them because I think that these are a lot of tickets that can go up, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight X and they can. Um, the question is, do we get an environment where people want to invest in the mining shares? Right. That's, that's a whole different issue. And to, to, to get people to invest in the mining shares, you need what looks like a sustainable path higher for the metals themselves. Um, and to your point at the beginning, we're, we're not seeing that right now. The, the precious metals are flip-flopping around. A lot of people expected them, given the backdrop, to be 2,500 or higher, and they're not. And that disappoints the people who are focused on the price. But um, the, the mining shares will perform extraordinarily well when the metals start to perform um, and when people feel they need to own these things rather than take a punt and try and make some money out of them. We haven't reached the point yet where where enough people think I need to own gold as as protection. Um, when that happens, and when we do get that kind of environment for the metals, then I think the miners will absolutely fly. But it, I don't think it's going to happen just yet. Yeah, Grant, let's uh, let's wrap up with uh, just one of the questions that was sent in because uh, we always solicit questions when we announce who the guest is going to be. <clears throat> and I, I'd like to get your opinion on this one. I think I like this one. Um, this is someone who owns no physical gold. I know I probably should, but every time I look to uh, buy, I think, wait a second, silver has got to be undervalued at 80 to one. So I end up buying more silver. Uh, what's wrong with me? What am I missing? Do you think silver still holds a place? Uh, is that something you own too? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I do. And, and again, you know, 
uh, it's been said many times, but silver is just, it does the same job as gold. It's just way more volatile. And you, know, you, you, you could uh, see silver outperform dramatically if you get a real precious metals um, bull market, for sure. Um, and, and so, look, it's, it's, it's down to everybody's own personal preferences for the, the amount of volatility they're willing to stomach. If you want to own silver, you want to own gold. I mean, there are there are so many exasperated silver holders out there, mm. um, and the ones that manage to hold on and 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 stay the course, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident will be rewarded at some point by by the metal reducing that that kind of ratio between it and gold. But in the meantime, you're going to have to stomach the volatility. So if if you, if you want to own precious metals and just put them in a you know in a safety deposit box somewhere and and not worry about them have a mix if you're going to be watching the price every day and you're going to be stressing about the performance then i would say you're better off with gold because hey we all need sleep exactly do, do, do you have any thoughts on the gold silver ratio you know people talk about you know historically it was yeah look it's way out of whack i mean yeah it's 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 way out of whack. people talk about six to one being the being the right ratio um you know I, and there are all kinds of reasons why they will back that up which obviously means it's wildly undervalued um but look i mean it's 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 all the way at one end of the pendulum right now it will swing back at some point because these things always do the question is will it overcorrect past the median price that's that's likely um but again it's it will be happening in volatile times and it's very difficult as as people in the crypto space have found out in recent weeks when things are volatile, it's it's difficult to think clearly. It's difficult to yeah. to hold hold on to a position, to stay the course, and 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 be sanguine about the kind of moves you see in in these in these crazy risk assets at times of great stress. So, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, it, the bull market is always going to try and throw you off the whole way through, uh, and that's why for me, I, I own these things to make purchasing power and and not to focus on the price so much and since i started doing that um it's been a much easier exercise in just thinking about the percentage of my assets that are in precious metals um i don't worry about the price so much anymore well all right my friend if someone were to uh leave from here and go directly to grant-williams.com what are they going to find there Oh uh, well, they're, they're gonna they're gonna find me, unfortunately. Um, but um, <laughs> but alongside me, you'll find plenty of really smart people that I talk to. Uh, you'll find the letter things that make you hum, and you'll find the the podcast series, um, which I've been doing for a couple of years now, and had some just tremendous guests. I mean, people have been fantastic giving me their time and their insight. And um, and you'll find uh, a series of videos I've been doing with. Uh, you know, real long form in-depth conversations with a bunch of um, super smart people, some of whom you won't have heard of, but um, all of whom are worth your time. So go you know, pay a visit and take a look. Yes, please be sure to check that out. And also before you leave, please be sure to hit the like button, maybe the subscribe button. Sprout Money doesn't ask for really anything for all this great content they put out. So if you can at least uh, thank them by hitting that like or subscribe button, that'll help us cast a wider net going forward. And of course, always keep them in mind if you're looking to buy some gold or silver, SproutMoney.com and that phone number 888-861-0775. We're wrapping up the month of June 2022. I want to thank Grant Williams for his time. Grant, thanks so much. This has been great. You're always welcome, my friend. Great to talk to you. And from all of us here at Sprout Money News and SproutMoney.com, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again next month.